G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the Round 2 Supercoach stock market video. Hope you're having a cracking week so far. I'll tell you what, this is arguably the most important stock here for the year. For the majority of players, their prices are going to start fluctuating from this week. A little bit of a unique year given the fact that we had opening rounds and things have changed for particular players already, but for most players, this is is where all the action starts. So I'm gonna keep this intro extremely short because we're gonna be going for about an hour 25, an hour and a half for this one. So sit back, relax, hope you enjoy. And if you haven't already, make sure that you check out the Supercoach Swordplay podcast where Jonathan and I discuss many of these players in even more detail. So hope you enjoy guys. Let's start off with the 600K plus defenders. At the top of the list this week, we have Luke Ryan. This bloke is on fire. Looks like a lock for a top four average in current form. A man with a sickening role and a massive ceiling. To be honest, he didn't even play that well last week and still scored a 127. We all know about his 165 the week before, and he will be coming into my side this week. As I said, the role's fantastic, takes a lot of marks, kicks the ball a lot, and his disposals are usually effective. Unlike Martin, who loves those little kicks, Ryan loves to give it a roost, get it long to a contest. He's got the monopoly on the kick-ins, taking 16 out of a possible 20. So we can't underestimate how beneficial that is for a player's scoring. The price isn't fantastic. I'm not saying there's a heap of value here, although for current output, yeah, he may be unattainable for at least a short term due to his very likely price rise. So if you started him, well done. And if not, like many of us, I would seriously look at him as an option to get into your side this week. Uh, Lockie Whitfield, my man Causa, the ladies man Blackledge, started with this bloke, would be wrapped with his output. A shame he's on the buy this week because I think he would be a very popular replacement for Hayden Young, but we'll chat in detail about him next week. Uh, Harry Sheasel, close to a must-have at his price. I know it's a big term, a big call saying a must-have, but I think, again, he could be the perfect replacement option for a Hayden Young. Nine kick in so far, so they're sharing him a little bit at north, but they love the ball in his hands, picking up plenty of the pill, and looks to improve from last year, averaging 33 and a half touches per game with scores of 130 and 113. In his first game, kicked the ball a lot more, so a likely reason for his high score there, but no reason to suggest that he'll go backwards or struggle to maintain this form, so a great trading target this week for me is Harry. A Will Powell, fantastic start to the season, averaging 111. A pot on fire, as you can see on the symbol, but a buy this week. Talk about him next week. Dan Houston, we have no problems here. I've talked a lot about him in the preseason and was in many of my draft teams. The run at Adelaide Oval is superb. He's scoring consistently. His teammates just love the ball in his hands. He's actually had a couple of turnovers by foot early last week, which is pretty rare for Dan, but cleaned things up as expected. He's got such a lethal right foot, and he's a great combo with Farrell, that right and that left. Only the three kick-ins in total, so we know that he doesn't really rely on that to score well. Any kick-out for Houston, I just view really as a bonus. His buy is fantastic, and if blokes like Janeth and JB from Dr. Supercoach started him, then we need to give him consideration. In my opinion, a fine trade-in option this week, particularly if you're looking at, say, a mini restructure. Tommy Stewart. Wow, we, Mr. Tommy, he was absolutely sublime, but it's like, come on, Nixie, would you mind not allowing this bloke to simply roam free, roam around the back 50, wherever he pleases, 400 Eden set marks just in the first quarter, and was close to setting records on the night. It was funny, I was talking to Abs, the Scodfather, just to calm her down uh, in one of our chats, and I said to him, this is just at the start of the game, I think, I've just got a really bad feeling about Tommy Stewart. And boy, I was wrong. He was doing it all. Even laid a goal-saving tackle with about 30 seconds to go on the first. Had 11 kick-ins in total, playing on 80% of the time. Fast forward to the end of the game. He finished on 134. Looking back these notes, I think that 11 kick-ins in total, that would be over the two games. So not 11 kick-ins just last week, but 134... 
I think that's, yeah, actually pretty poor for what he actually produced and what he, how he played. I mean, come on, that was a 150-plus game every day of the week. There was a game, was it last year or the year before, where I questioned Fantasy Freako. I was so dirty about it because I really thought he got underscored. And as a non-owner, pretty happy he got underscored for this one as well. Um, but look, what I've got there is a safe premium pick, a nice ceiling, elite scoring data in the role, but keep in mind that not all coaches will be as foolish as Nick's and let him do what he wants. There'll be games where he does receive attention. If going, say, up from young, he's definitely, definitely one to consider. Uh, Jaden Short in current form, he may be in current owners' teams for a short period of time, pardon the pun. Sorry, that was shocking, wasn't it? But this is... Oh, man... I think he seems like a trap. Nowhere near a top premium at this point in time. His kicking numbers are dwindling, 8-5 and only 3 last week. And to make things worse, he's only played on 69% of the time from those kick-ins, which I'm guessing would be the lowest in the comp. A poor starting selection that you may need to, to, quick, to fix pretty quickly, I'd say. Uh, Hayden Young, the competition is getting restless with Young and... At the time of recording, he is the number one traded out player in the comp. One of my biggest preseason locks. And to be punted from the team two weeks into the season, I didn't see this coming. I'm super disappointed, to be honest. All signs were pointing to this being a fantastic pick. Maybe I didn't respect some of the warning signs in that first preseason game. We were underwhelmed. Then the second pracky game kicked a couple of goals, looked okay. But his two games to open the season have been shocking. So it's pretty much three failures in four games if you look at it that way. Personally, I've seen enough. We know he's a big talking point this week. Most of the good coaches that I know are looking to get him out. 19 clangers in two games. It's an absolute coach killer and not something that I would usually associate with this bloke. Another fella that could swap his footy boots for a butcher's apron. So at 525,100, three rounder of 66 and a break even of 165. If he goes, he's projected, he's losing 40K just in the one week. And the scary thing is now, and the big question you've got to ask yourself is who are you going to even at the same price? So you're looking at what's that 485K. I just don't think that there's anyone there. So for me, I just... Yeah, I just do not like it. Don't like it. Out of the pick. Um, but we've already gone through a few pretty nice options I think you can bring in for him. Uh, King Nick. Well, Dacos the King has fallen, but just temporarily. And I'm sure he'll have the crown on his head again soon. After a couple of 130s, remember, the first 130 didn't even count for actual super coach scoring. It obviously did for his price. But he dropped an absolute stinker last week. Only registering 54 points from 24 touches. It's amazing how quickly things can change. Last week, Owens was celebrating a successful pick. This week, there are people that are actually trading him out. The Dacos dump is getting some traction. It's the worst game he's played, in my opinion. The first quarter wasn't too bad, but after that, just nothing. So many little things that we don't normally associate with Dacos. There was... Oh, like a missed tackle on Owens that was costly, led to a Higgins goal. He also had some really unlucky moments, like chipped a perfect pass to, I think it was Crisp, who dropped the easy mark. Those things sting. With a break-even of 167, that low score in his system, a potential fin tag, some people may actually jump ship, but personally, I'm riding it out, and given the fact his ownership's so high, it's a play that I'm pretty comfortable with. The other thing is that you, you'd have to have pretty much the perfect team and you'd have to be the least of your worries. If that's the case, then go for it. But I think most of us have more pressing concerns. Last time we played the Lions in, a home, in the home and away season, this is, he scored a 151. So as an owner, like many other people out there, I'm hoping that he can go close to that again. He's the type of bloke that's got the ceiling to actually possibly even hit that break even. And we'll finish with the assist dog now. Went bang and in a single quarter had surpassed his previous week's score. A lazy 15 touches 
and nine marks in the first for 60 points. The Hawthorne game plan, as we were discussing last night, was absolutely sickening. It's not viable, and surely they can't play like this moving forward. A lot would have jumped off, and this is before this week, and for good reason, but for those who stuck fat with Sis, they would have been rejoicing. Remember, he was originally rubbed out this week, so possibly lucky to be playing, but I really did think that he'd get off. Ended on 123 points, which is kind of low for how he started, so really only averaged 20 points a quarter after that first, but... As a selection, it's definitely good signs for him moving forward. On to the defenders, 250 to 500k. And we've got Lockie Bramble up the top this week. Maybe a surprise to some, but I think a really good addition to the dogs after coming across from Hawthorne last year. My mate Ange is all over him, so shout out to you, Ange. For her sake, I hope he really works out. Playing a defensive role, looks locked into the 22 and preferred over blokes like Daniel. Averaging 96 after two rounds and looking at a couple of healthy price rises at least. Taking six kickouts in total, which is the second most for the Dogs. Love a little bonus and some upside and I think he's a really solid player. 20 touches at 85% for 84 super coach points last week. If you can go close to replicating that most weeks, I think he could be a solid option. I'll say this with most Dogs players, but there's a chance that they may get bevoed at any time. And if his form dips, I think he is easily replaceable. So for me, that could be a decent stopgap. But if you haven't got Massimo, he's got to take precedent if you don't already own him. Uh, Jeremy McGovern. He's tempting a few people that I know, and I guess I can see the reasons why. He's obviously a talented player, plays his role as good as anyone. The role is generally friendly to Supercoach scoring. The ball spends a lot of time in the Eagles' back line. He's taken the most kickouts West Coast with 12 in total and played on from 11. And the ceiling is there. And we've got the data from a 140-plus score last week. But then come the red flags. His consistency is questionable, and his floor can be low. And the big one for me, this is huge, it's his durability. When's the last time this bloke played a full season? His season game count from 2020 to 2023 is 12, 15, 10, and 9. So you need to ask yourself, is this something I'm willing to invest in, given the fact that our back line's already been decimated? It's a no from me, but if you can finally get his body right... He could be a wonderful pod. I'm just not willing to take the risk myself. Already too many injuries down there and too much carnage to even consider it for me. Uh, Marcus Wintager, his stocks have risen, particularly after the news that Brad Crouch will be out for a period of time. A talented player who I had in my team last year, but this year it's all about the role. After playing in defense last year, he seems to have translated, for now anyway, into a full-time midfielder. In round one, Crouch attended 70% of the CBAs, with Windy at a lowly 17%. But with Crouch out last week, that 17% went up to 83% for Windy. So he was the second man behind Steele. Had 24 touches, which was good. But what really impressed me, and I think this is what got him to that score of 104, was the fact that 16 of those possessions were contested. You throw in six tackles seven clearances and that is a fantastic game the seven clangers let him down and that probably prevented this from being a 125 plus score 86 percent tog now does he keep the role i think there's a good chance surely they want to get past blokes like ross uh, who else jones uh whoever else there is and just give this bloke an opportunity to partner up with Jack Steele. He may play a negating role at times, which may lower his ceiling, but he should be able to make up some of those points by laying tackles and putting on some of those defensive acts. If you're keen for someone at his price, then I'd be happy to select him as a stepping stone should you make the cash. And at a bare minimum, for now, he'll be a stopgap that will give you some decent on-field points. So... I'm not going there myself, but I can certainly see why some coaches would. 
Uh, Josh Weddle, one of my favourite players to watch in the comp. I think I say that every time I talk about Weddle. Love the way he takes the game on. Decent role, averaging 93. That sees him enter the discussion for a split second here, but the price is extremely awkward, and I'd prefer his teammate at a much cheaper price. Jordan Clark, very interesting. Averaging like a premium at the moment, enjoying a nice slice of the defensive scoring pie at the Dockers. He's the only player apart from Luke Ryan to take a kick in at Frio, but only four in total. So we're not talking huge numbers here. Averaging 26 touches and a nice kick to handball ratio. It was his high disposal efficiency of 89% that really allowed him to score so well last week. He's a cheaper alternative to his teammate Ryan and will enjoy a nice early rise. The question is, can he average enough to obtain a top eight average in defense? I need to see it for longer. So for me, it's just too risky to jump on. I'd much rather prefer waiting and then having to pay, say, an extra 50K. It's not ideal having to pay more, but I would be much more comfortable just with the security that this is going to be a, d a decent pick, let's just say. Uh, Kane Farrell, he, look, he's a new version of the cannon at Port, and does this man have a leg on him? Kicks it with ease from 60, 65 out, super damaging by foot. Loves a cheeky around the back handball receiver as well when players are, say, just out of their kicking range for goal. And he did kick a couple in round one. Uh, what's it been? Nine kickouts in total. That's just behind Burton, I think think it is. Scores 105, 101 to start the season. That's really solid. And he's another pod on fire for his price. We love Ports buy. We love their fixture. So one for the Lone Wolves here. But again, an awkward price. It would take balls of steel, St. Elephant Titus here, to actually bring him in. But uh, yeah, all power to you if you're willing to do it. With Harris Andrews, the Lions percentage would be so low it's not funny without this bloke oh man where would we be he's carried this team for the first two weeks nothing's getting past him in all australian form and his intercept marks and long inspector gadget arms you can see the new symbol there i've given him his own one the old inspector gadget head because it just reminds me of him so much that gave him a 119 average and for me it's really well deserved Fantastic selection in draft. I've got him there, real sneaky one. But in classic, there are just probably too many in front. Kudos to the captain, though. The floor worries me at times. It's, uh, you know, that those... And when we say key position, he's not that traditional. He's obviously that intercept-type player. But when we've got your Houstons, your, your Ryans, and your Sheasel types, I just don't see myself selecting... A Harris Andrews myself, although I, I do love the man. Uh, Elliot Yo, healthy for now, which is good. I'm not surprised to see him scoring well. The role and the talent there, I knew that, but the lingering, lingering, sorry, worry of Yo is going down at any point in time. It's not good for my super coach well-being. If you believe in his body and think it will hold up for the season, then I think he's a decent selection. Averaging 103 with a break even of 47 is pretty nice. Would you trade him in for Young? Oh, look, you'd pocket some coin. It's a no for me, but you can go there if you feel lucky. It's just like, you're not happy with Young. Yo goes down. You think to yourself, why on earth did I do it? I didn't start him because of durability, and now I've got him in. I just, yeah, I just wouldn't go through the pain myself. But you could go through some great joy if the low percentage actually comes through that he doesn't injure himself. And uh, down the bottom here, we have Nazaya Wanganin Millera. Another big talking point this week. Just so clean. Loved him in his draft year, and I selected him last year. Just getting better and better with his footy IQ. Disposal, as you mentioned, is elite. Was watching him on Thursday night. Just had this lovely 1 2 3, linking up from half back through the wing. It was a loose ball get. 1 2s. It was just phenomenal, and I thought, yep, yeah, this bloke is elite. He still needs to increase his strength. He was easily outmarked by a Schultz. I know they're different body types, and you don't necessarily need him to outmark Schultz. That's not his role. But later on, Dugowie, I think it was, shook the hips, just denied a tackle attempt. 
So there's things that he certainly needs to develop. I think more his body we're talking about here. Had eight kickouts in round one, but only the one last week. And he actually scored better. He comes at a pretty awkward price, so if you're selecting him, you're selecting him as a keeper, not a stepping stone. Will he even be the highest averaging defender at the Saints? Remember, Jack Sinclair also needs to warm up into the season. But like Sinclair, like all his teammates, has a nice Marvel run coming up a little bit later on. So it would be lovely if that run was a little bit earlier. All in all, in my opinion, if you're looking to go down, and we're not talking all the way down to Massimo, he is the best downgrade option for young at this stage. On to the defenders under 250k. And at the top, we have Massimo D'Ambrosio. After 120 in his first official game for the Hawks, he backed that up with another good performance, albeit not as good as the week before. He had a huge DT to SC ratio discrepancy at quarter time, had the sun symbol on fire on fan footy with 32 points from six touches. But in the SC column, the reading was only half as good, literally, with a score of 16. But it was all good super coach news from there with his ratio evening up. And it was pretty obvious early on that he was a must-have selection. And even though his role isn't ideal, he's playing it to perfection. He did actually start down back at time, so it wasn't 100% wing. With so many defensive issues facing us at the moment, he's a great stopgap, great money maker to put you out of a little spot of bother. I've seen enough to be confident now. His break even is at negative 82. So even if he pushes out a 60, he'll still make 65K in just the one week. I'm all over him this week and wish I'd gone early. He's the most traded in player at time of recording. And again, I think this is for very good reason. Uh, Charlie Dean, he is on the bubble, but I doubt he'll be selected this week. So an easy pass for now. At time recording, team sheets have still not been up. Uh, Toby Pink, around 10%, I think it was from memory, are looking to trade in Pink this week. Last week, start off the game really well. Great intercept mark, holding the ball, tackle early, got a free kick. Even got gifted a 50 meter penalty and then did the right thing by us. Hand it off to Shees. There were some crude jokes thrown around in our Twitter chat, but uh, we'll keep this PG. You blokes know who you are, but Pinky ended up on 58 points from 10 touches, so his scoring did slow up a little bit. Job security seemed solid, and let's be honest, he's one of the only cheap blokes that is actually healthy and whose body is not letting him down at the moment. So if you're looking for a cheap defensive pick, he is the best out of list of ordinary options. But again... Definitely look to get in mass over pink if you've got the coin to do so. And I'd actually recommend trying to find the coin if you do need to go up. I do think the ship has sailed with Howes. You needed to jump on last week. He was labelled as a must-have, so hopefully you did. He'll continue to make some coin and sit at D6 for many of us, myself included. Uh, Bowley, Bowley, Bowley even, Euland is on the buy this week, already had a rise, so we may talk about him next week if we're desperate. Uh, Zachary Williams should be better off after giving the body a rest during the buy. Hasn't set the world on fire so far, but as he warms up, I expect his average to rise and be a solid selection for us. Four kick-ins in total as a very small bonus. Hopefully that rises along with his ceiling. Marty Hall, Unfortunately, was the sub. So Melbourne have been killing us with their sub selections. Came on for May to play in the second half to give me a grand total of 12 points, which was useless in the best 18 round. Thank goodness it was a best 18. But with May out for at least this week, Lever also out. I'm not sure what the severity of his issue is, though, if he's even back this week. I really don't know. But hopefully in the short term, it could even be the one, maybe two weeks, his job security should be okay. It, it's looking to be a little bit more solidified anyway. The awkward thing as a non-owner is that it's hard to trade in a bloke who started as a sub the previous week. Just check out the team sheets, but I'd be surprised not to see him named on field. And at this stage, I'm certainly going pink. I think that pink's the much safer pick. Uh, and down the bottom, the Supercoach gods, they've continued to curse us with yet another defensive rookie going down in Nick Caulfield. We wouldn't believe it, but at the end of the day, we selected three, knowing that they've all got durability concerns. We're talking about Reed, Gibkus, but now Caulfield. 
is down and out as well. They say that things happen in threes. Hopefully this is it for the year. Like, come on, this is ridiculous. And Supercoach aside, geez, I feel for the young bloke. Apparently he was punching walls in the change rooms downstairs and just super frustrated. You know, finally back in the park, fresh start, new team, and the body lets him down again. So, Nick, I know you're not listening, but uh, get well soon, mate. Hope your recovery goes well. But super coach wise now a dead pick. Damn, this one hurts. On to the midfielders, 500k plus. And at the top, we have Caleb Sarong. What a start to the season the Shlong has had. A very popular primo trading option this week. And he looks to have gone to another level. One thing I've noticed is that he's improved his spreads, working better on the outside. We know he's an inside bull, and that's what he does best. Just uses his body so well. There was a contest in the center early on versus Wardlaw, and he just turned his body, bumped him off the ball, lovely ground ball get, handball clearance to Brayshaw. That single act really showed off his talents and strength, and he's one of the hottest mids in the comp for good reason. The frustrating thing is that I'm not surprised because I own him for 75% of the preseason. Hindsight, hindsight, I know, but even I didn't see those massive early scores and ceiling games coming. He could have had a goal with about six seconds to go before half time. It was touched. And then he had another kick, which was, I think, originally intended more of a part, more as a pass, but that got touched by Pink on the line as well. So if those two goals go through, we could have seen a butters-like score. A potential downside to his red-hot start is that surely there'll be some opposition attention most likely coming his way. And remember that you'll never get his round one and two scores. They're gone. But I love the selection, seriously considering him for myself this week. Uh, Jack Steele started off like an absolute animal. And within the first 10 minutes, I decided that I need to seriously, seriously consider bringing him in. A 49 point first quarter from only six possessions, but it was five tackles. That's what really caught my eye. He looks super impressive to me, really strong, but covering the ground well. Back to the man of steel of old. That's what I've got in my notes here. Back to his old self. No kryptonite in sight. We know Ross loves his players to run, but I think Jack's got a better balance, and I like that little bit of extra strength. He's tackling like a madman again, which always boosts his floor. And I can actually see a world where he can be a solid M8. He's done better than that before, and the man looks mighty hungry to make a big impact this year. I think it's a bargain price for what he can produce and what he is producing at the moment. So I give this the tick of approval. Scores of 119 and 120 are consistent, and he's got two good incoming matchups against Essendon and Richmond. So no reason why this man can't average, say, 115. Uh, Zaki Butters, thank you, JB. If not for chatting with the legend from Dr. Supercoach during our port preview, I would have faded this man due to those concerns about his ankles. But JB reassured me, ankle's fine. So I put him back in, went back to my preseason research, and what a reward he gave me last week. A 170 plus in a game where he absolutely dominated, to put it lightly. And we all remember the game against the D's in the wet last year. This was his real breakout game where he just tore them apart. He was the only player that looked like he was playing with a dry ball in just horrid conditions. And he's also playing the D's this week. Surely he couldn't back up to 170 plus scores. Who knows, the man's got the talent, but on the weekend collected 34 touches, 15 of those contested, went at 85% efficiency, seven clearances, a goal, and only the one clanger. Super clean, ultra damaging, and really did tear the Tigers apart. If you're looking to upgrade to an Uber mid, he could definitely be a man, and as an added bonus, he's got the best buy possible. Such a hard watch as a non-owner, so I'll tell you what, I reckon just jump on the Butters train, people. Jump on board and enjoy the ride. Uh, the next three blokes are, <clears throat> excuse me, all in great form, but unfortunately, they're all on the buy. You've got Took the trademark Miller, and then the two absolute bulls, Tom Green and Matty Rao. We obviously don't look to trade them in this week, so we'll leave the detailed discussion for next week's stocky, but all three should be highly on your watch list anyway. Uh, Errol Goulden, man, oh man. Midway through the second quarter, he was on 25-odd points. 
Then something happened. A switch flicked inside him and he just started to dominate. He punched out a quick 30 plus points to end that second quarter and then just went bang and ended with 90 points in the second half. The bloke is unreal. And just when I thought I could get him at an absolute bargain after his buy, it may not be the case. A score of 149, well, that will ensure his break even doesn't go low. So a definite trade in target after his buy, if you like him as a selection. My wife started with him, and I promise you, it's not one of those teams where I make it up for the wife. She did everything herself, so super proud of her. Helps him with the stocky, so certainly knows her stuff. Is leading the family rankings at the moment as well, so I shouldn't even say that out loud and in public, but she had the VC on Errol last week, so there you go. Uh, maybe she should be doing this and talking instead of me. Uh, Kripa, look, I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, we discussed him in the Swordplay potty. There was a question about him, and Janeth, a Carlton man, didn't give his tick of approval, so that's good enough for me. A solid start to the year, though. You can't deny that. Uh, the Chad, super talented player and great to own in the keeper draft with the super coach edge boys we discussed him last week and nothing much has changed his lowest return for the season with the 102 but 28 touches two goals over 500 meters gained should have scored higher but a few clangers and not the greatest efficiency one we don't need to bring in now but definitely have a look after his buy uh Zeret, a 127 and 132 to open his 2024 campaign no parish in the side and he's looked fantastic Bit shocked Finn didn't go to him in round one because that may have put some people actually, well, put some people off actually starting him. History suggests his price will become friendly at some point. Something just tends to happen with Zeret, but he has hit 30 plus possessions and five tackles and average per game and even kicked a couple of snags last week to boost his score more. And for me, you've got the eight ball there very likely to be a top eight averaging defender. And finally, Noah Anderson, well, he's also on the buy this week. So we'll get into more of a detailed discussion with Noah next week. We'll continue on with the 500k plus mids. We've got the cement bag, had a solid start to the season, just getting better and better each week. Scores 108, 119 and 146 last week. Was on fire in the first with 10 touches, 39 points. Missed a goal, so that could have been more. And then just continued to dominate the Supercoach scoring sheet. Averaged 56% CBAs behind Vine and Oliver. But he's so dangerous as a forward. He's kicked a goal in each of his games to date. I'd like to see him increase his average tackle count to say four to five, but can't complain too much with his output so far. Definitely one I'm planning to have in my side when the time's right, but I don't think we need to rush to get him in now. Andy Brayshaw getting massively overshadowed by Sarong, Ryan, Young, even Fife as talking points, so sort of flying under the radar, but not doing anything overly special, averaging a tick under 30 touches over his first two games, 102, 123, it's okay but not something we need to trade in now. One to monitor for the next maybe four, eight weeks. Uh, Rory Laird, consistent start for the desk with scores of 120, 124. Good job if you selected him over Dawson. I was never huge into Laird this year as I thought his CBAs may suffer slightly, maybe a little bit more time forward. He's still scoring well though with an average of 60, uh, what is it, 66%. He's also averaging eight and a half tackles per game, which is impressive. Not a really sexy option, and I prefer some of the next gen type picks, but one I'll keep on my watch list as an upgrade if required. LDU, I'm a big fan of this pick, and his post by average last year was phenomenal. Not as influential last week as compared to game one with a score of only 105, but still had 30 touches with an even kick to handball ratio. Over half of those possessions were contested. Nine clearances, CBA rate of 83%. And he is North's number one mid. Could explode this year, but there's always that durability concern at the back of your mind. If you started, say, a Bont, Green and Sarong combo, this bloke would complement them well. That's if you're looking to add another primo option to your mix. I, I think that that just looks really nice as a pairing. Connor OZ, a quieter game in Supercoach. Well, Supercoach wise last week anyway. And if you went for a pod move and selected, let's just say the safer in inverted commas, Rosie over Butters, 
then you'd be hurting right now after watching Butters go bananas last week. I think that Rosie bounces back. It will turn out to be a fine selection, captain of the club, and one of the most talented players in the comp. So I think you keep the faith, but it does hurt if you don't own Zach. Uh, Mr. Bontempelli started the game with the first clearance. My heart sunk with about two minutes, 30-something to go in the last quarter. I was feeling the worst. Bont's ankle got caught under him in a two tackle. He was on the ground holding it, but thank goodness he was okay for then. A couple of minutes later, though, nailed the goal from 50 on the siren. So that was a massive sigh of relief. And we thought, here we go, all good. In the second, copped a couple of other knocks and did look a little sore. Dropped a mark on the lead inside 50, but was still dominating. Then with about five minutes to go on the second, he came off and they mentioned he may have had an issue with his right knee. A very quiet third quarter, only 16 points, some uncharacteristic turnovers by foot. Then in the fourth, got a couple of early score assists then a beautiful snap for goal from the stoppage. That was his second for the game. But again, two quick turnovers after that and a holding the ball free against. It really did cap his ceiling. I wonder if his disposal was affected by that knee slash ankle issue. I may be making excuses for him as he did have eight touches in the first 10 minutes of the last quarter. So he was everywhere, kept playing on, which is obviously a good sign. Bevo's wacky, but surely he wouldn't risk the Rolls Royce. Now, quick edit. There are rumours that Bont may be laid out with Jack McRae as his replacement. It is doing the rounds, but I can't confirm it. So please take this with a grain of salt. Thought I'd quickly share it. Don't shoot the messenger. Hopefully he plays. But, well, if he does, and he's sore, would they sub him out if they're 10 goals up just to give him a rest? Oh, Bevo's capable of everything. I'm not going to think about that now. Not time to panic. Let's continue with the stocky. Uh, Josh Dunkley, oh, look, an okay start to the season, but one we can just wait on. Track, see how he performs the next couple of weeks. The Lions by has now come and gone, so back to, what would we say, a level playing field now. As Lions man myself, I'd love to own him. I actually don't have a single Lions player in my team for possibly the first time ever. So, yeah, hopefully Dunkley, Dunk, Dunkley, jeez. It's very late, people. I apologize. It is very late. Hopefully, Dunkley can uh, really get on the bike and start to pump out some elite numbers. Libra. Mr. Libertore had owners worried with a 92 to open his account, but better this week with a 115. Lined up on Rao, which was just a tantalizing matchup. Two absolute bulls going head to head. None of them were taking a backward step. Was not scoring overly well early, but really came into the game, particularly in the third quarter. Great tackle inside 50 in the third, holding the ball, kicked the set shot. Oh, uh, look, this week, what do you say? It, it, it didn't look as good. Look, you're never going to break records. What was it? 20 clearances and all that sort of stuff. They're not my expectations, but he did have 12 less touches in his last game but he increased his score by 23 points. The big thing here was laying nine tackles. Amazingly, only had the one last week. So I'd be expecting an average of, well, six plus. Jonathan and I both agreed last night that he's a hold. And even though it's hard watching some other guys go bonkers, I'm sure Libba will hit a ceiling game soon. Possibly this week against a local Eagles midfield. From memory though, doesn't have the best average against them. Even so, I'm backing in this man for a 130 plus. Surely against West Coast, Libra does that. Uh, Clary, Janeth discussed Clary as a trading target after the buy on the Swordplay Potty last night. So check that out for a more detailed review. But I totally agree. And we could be getting him around the 580k mark. I expect his TOG and CBA rate to rise as he worked his way into the season after a very limited preseason. And for some, just the fact that he has been out of sorts, hasn't had that great, great preseason, that may be enough for you to say, I'm completely out of this pick for the whole season. That's completely fine. But on the other hand, Clary is a different beast and already at his tender age, he's a super coach Hall of Famer. So don't look to bring him in now. But watch him closely, at least give him that much respect and pounce on him if you think the time's right. 
And it was great to see him look so happy as well. Just a side note, after the game of that interview with Max Gorn, put a smile on my face anyway. John Newcomb, my son Maxi, now, yeah, maturity level's not, not really high, but he's been calling him Jai Pukum after starting him in his own side. So he's been getting flamed by an 11-year-old here. But unlike Steele and Co., he just hasn't been performing. And I'll just make this really quick. We'll stop it now. Get rid of him. Find money to invest in a true premium midfielder. And Jordan Dawson. Oh, I'll tell you what, another discussion point here. And I've got so many notes, but I'm aware of the time here. It is so late. A chunk of current owners are planning to show Jordan the Dawson this week. How's that for being clever? Another player, Jonathan, and I discussed in great detail last night the Saw Clay, on the Sawplay Play potty. It is timestamp, so if you're really interested in listening to our more in-depth thoughts about this pick and whether or not he's a trade or not, then give it a listen. But in a nutshell, as you can see from the symbols, there are reasons to trade, reasons to hold, and for non-owners, I've got the target there because he could be a nice fallen premium option to jump on. The only thing I will say, which we did mention last night, was that news has come through that there is a possibility that Hayden Young will do a defensive job on him. Not good for either player. So if you think Dawson is in for another sub ton, I'd actually get off him as he'll leak big amounts of cash. But ideally you hold your back of preseason research and he comes good again. Remember last week he was actually the highest fantasy scorer and he posted a 130 in that format. But his disposal was lacking, which is usually rare for him, and it did result in a below pass super coach score. So if he fixes that, he could get back to his elite scoring. But this is very much, yeah, personal decision for owners. Hold or chop, it's up to you. But whatever you do, all the best of luck. On to the midfielders, 250 to 500k. And at the top, we have my man, Jared Lyons. Had the week off after two solid performances to open 2024. I must admit, even as a Lions supporter, this pick confuses me. I've got the buy now symbol there, if you think he continues to score like he is. But at the same time, I've got the worried and the sub symbol, as there's a real chance once Lockie Neal gets back in particular and Devers had a full game under his belt, that he may be a sub-candidate or even omitted. If he continues to play full games, he should be a solid pick, but I, for one, didn't have him in our best 23 going into the season, so my gut says be cautious, but at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised to see him make some decent coin, reward his owners, and 94 average at the price is fantastic. Team C sheets should be live in, what's the time? Oh, probably by now, what, about 15 minutes? I should have probably left that slide. But, yeah, be sure to check those out. I don't love it myself, though. But do what you want to do. Don't listen to my opinion. I didn't even think he'd be selected in the opening round. So, so there you go. Riley Bonner. Wowee. What has happened with this pick? This is why we don't go early. After looking a million bucks in round one, he looked like a cheap suit last week. Got nowhere near it early. You know, he finally gets a touch in the second and commits a shocking turnover. 25 meter kick straight to Schultz after seagulling it around the back in the first place. A goal against his name. Taking 10 kickouts in total. That's a positive, but the majority of those are in round one. Only had the two last week. Lots of bonus points potentially out the window there. He's gone from pretty much a big miss to a big relief. And if we don't own him... This is an easy skip now. What can happen in a single week? It's unbelievable, isn't it? I was waiting to see how he did with Sinclair. And after seeing it, I didn't like it. One you'll most likely have to jump off soon, but you could do worse. And he could do a Fisher and go bang, make us rethink. But 49 points, 69, was it 64% efficiency. Uh, what do we say? It's almost like like the ghost of Bonner now. I do feel sorry for Rabs. It, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going to work. It, it could, though. I'm not saying that it won't. Uh, we'll set a goat here. Now, you'll notice I've got the symbol there. This man is on fire. Not a heap discussion needed, though. I don't think many people are selecting, but my boy Joey from the center bounce, he let us know all about this man and his talent. So we've got the symbol back for 2024. Love you, brother. Shout out to you. Cannot wait to catch up soon, my man. All righty. So now we're going to go... I might just skip Matty Crouch. 
We'll go to Matt Maxi Holmes. I'll get to Crouch. What an exciting player this fella is. Averaging 104 after two games, playing a nice friendly role down at the Cattery. Loves to use his elite speed to take the game on. On the weekend, gather 24 touches. Nice balance of contested and uncontested. 475 metres gain, so nothing ultra special, but certainly solid. Unfortunately, don't think solid is good enough for a mid-spot, so a pod but a pass. Uh, Ollie Wines. The wine tastes average, and I've got sour grapes after selecting him over my man, Matty Crouch. Absolute definition of a nothing, nothing pick. He won't make substantial money. He isn't scoring much more than that Uber rookies. But at the same time, he isn't playing poorly enough to be a must trade. Even with Horn Francis out, he didn't score overly well. It's super frustrating, particularly if you have him at M6. To be honest, if that's the case, I'll just move him on. Get one of those good rookies on field, invest elsewhere. A break even of 70, an average of 97 is meh. But one that I'm just holding for now, I'll upgrade when the time's right. Hopefully the matchup against Melbourne will favour his contested style of play. And Nicky Martin, I don't even want to talk about him. I parted ways with the Butcher last week. I just couldn't sit through games watching him chop the ball up. Kick it to 2v1s against. Last week, there was no Redmond. I thought, this is his time to shine. Show us his ceiling. But no, better than last week for sure. Still found the ball, but I didn't see a top eight defender. He's had nine kick-ins, which is second. And he's played on 100% of the time. But I wonder how many times he's actually hit the target, though. Look, if you've got faith that he can start to use the footy better, you could hold. It may be a matter of getting more experience in the role, then he'll come good. Had 100% tog in the first half, so he can run out games really well. And when others start to drop off, he could come into his element. So some potential upside maybe there, along with his future DPP, and the fact that McGrath may be dealing with a niggle. But lots of risks and better plays to switch to while you can now, in my opinion. So now that I've traded him, watch this bloke become an out and out keeper. I can just see it now. And Matty Crouch, let's talk about Matty Crouch. Now, this one stings on a personal level. I had him in my team hours before the first lockout and I made the late switch to Wines again and really followed the crowd rather than back my gut. But it is what it is. We know his strengths. That's certainly his hands, ability to find the pill with the ease and we know his deficiencies, but he's worked hard on some of those. He's looking really fit, although Tog wouldn't suggest that. There's always been an issue with the crowd selection. But points per minute, they're fantastic. So Tog not great. It doesn't tend to kick the ball a lot. We, 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 I'm not going to go over all of this stuff because we've known him for years and I don't think things have changed apart from, as I said, improving on those couple of things there. It looks like Barry is going to be the one that should suffer and i don't see crouch's cbas going majorly backwards he's currently averaging 77 percent cbas second to dawson and i think it's around 10 percent from the lead 37 touches at 89 percent is elite that's what he did last week but again only 287 meters gained i'm not going to do division at this time but it's not fantastic that's always been his style though and this is where some of his criticism comes from but as long as he's getting that much of the ball and scoring a 120 plus we don't really care how he goes about it i think he's a realistic trading option and what i thought was a very big stretch say a month ago even when i was keen on him as a pick it doesn't seem as much of a stretch let's just say that he could be our m8 for the year lots of mids i'd rather own but value for money we've got to take that into account it's undeniable and he's got scoring history he's got you know, elite history in that bracket. So definitely in my considerations, but most likely if you missed out on him as a starting pick, you've got other options that are further up your priority list. But if you do want to trade him in, I'm certainly not totally against it. Let's look at some cheaper options now and discuss the midfielders we can select under 250k. And at the top, we've got Jack Carroll right up there with the best rookie tradings this week. Now, rather than listen to me, I'll insert a quick clip so you can hear about this bloke from a Carlton fan. The next bloke probably we're going to talk about, and I'm going to give you this, uh, give you the floor here because it's one of your boys. Mm. It's Jack Carroll. <laughs> Originally, I was even considering bringing Carroll in last week, um, given the fact that 
you could use a loop and I didn't have a loop in my midfield. I thought that could actually work out okay there. I decided not to go there and, and leave it that extra week. I've heard some pretty positive reviews about this fella. I put a tweet out the other week asking if it was, and I'll tell you what, the response I got, JP was on there, the rain man, yourself, uh, Damon, super coach, Edge, so many great Carlton people did reply to that, which I really appreciated. And a big theme that I got was all around Sam Walsh. Great while Sam Walsh isn't there, but when <laughs> Walsh returns, yeah. we don't know how well he's going That's to be fine. coming. Now, I did see a quick tweet. I just glanced past it just before he started recording, saying that he may potentially be back in two to three weeks. I had yeah. someone else tell me it might be more mid-season buy type stuff. So I'm a little bit all over the shop. I've got varying information. I'm going to give it to you now, mate. Tell us about Jack Carroll and what you think his prospects are going to be if you're looking to trade him in this week. So Carroll as a player is really good. And we've seen that already um, in the first couple of games he played. Like, geez, I'm sorry for keeping having to keep bringing this up. Like, But he scored 16 in a quarter against your mob. Turned the game, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> and then he backed it up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said I'm sorry. I had to. No, you did. You, no, you did. You, you're, you're a good bloke, Janet. Going about it that way. Yeah. Unlike Spills, who's yeah. off gallivant with his girlfriend and not, not being with his brothers. But anyway, that's right, mate. I'll move on. I'm not cut. I'm not cut. Uh, do you want a tissue? <laughs> I deserve All right, mate. I deserve that. Okay. Um, he's got 74 against Richmond. So the scoring is not an issue. It's purely job security, right? And all I can say is so Sam Walsh has had lingering back issues. So he's, he had it a couple of years ago or yes, a couple of years ago. And now he's had it. He's had this issue again where his back's just, he's just, it's just flaring up and it's, it's impacting his sort of ability. I don't know where it's come from because I, when in his first couple of seasons, he was like the Iron Man. He was playing week in, week out, no issues. Jack Carroll was, had the biggest raps from Patrick Cripps in the offseason. Off any player, it was like every, most players, but especially Cripps was like, when, who do you see breaking out this year? Jack Carroll, Bot Carroll. Um, and he sort of took him under his wing. You even seen Roman Bryan when, um, <laughs> after the Carlton win against Richmond, when he's interviewing Jack Carroll, he's got Patrick Cripps and his arms draped around his shoulder. It's like, it's, there's like a genuine brotherhood between them. I'm pretty sure they're both Perth boys from the same junior club, which is why that link is there. I can. Um, and Jack Carroll is, he's going to be a fine player in the future. Now, Sam Walsh, they say two to three weeks. If we string together some wins, I can see that pushing out more and more because he's too important for player for us to rush him back in. Yeah. And I think that's where the mid-season buy part comes in because... Last week, the timeline was indefinite. This week, it's two to three weeks. He's on a modified program. He'll work his way up to full fitness. And Carlton, as a medical team, tend to take it very conservative. So I know some medical teams just, as soon as they're 99% ready to go, they're on. And they're onto the park. We take it 100. They need to be 101%. We saw with Sack Williams. He wasn't blooded in the preseason game. Had to make sure that he got got through his hurdles, got through his stepping stones, and he got in. With that in mind, I'm bringing in Jack Carroll. Take that for what you will. I don't own Jeremy Sharp, so I'm going Carroll over Sharp. Um, for Lincoln, your your question, I think that Jack Carroll, if he gets three weeks at North, Frio, Adelaide, he should make enough cash that even if Walsh comes back and his role is affected, I still think he stays in the side. Hope you enjoyed that from the professor. Certainly all over the Jack Carroll pick. Uh, next is Colby McKercher, one of the big three Uber rookies, as Janeth referred to him last night. No discussion needed. The only thing I will say is this. Before the start of the North Melbourne game this week, ensure that he's in your side and playing on field, silky skills, becoming confident with every quarter he plays and a superb role. Tick, tick, tick for Colby. Jeremy Sharp. 
looking like another successful rookie pick in the short term anyway, playing that wing role for Frio as expected and playing it well. They targeted him for that particular role and he's built for it. It's a really tough decision if you have to choose between Sharp and Carroll. I like Carroll's scoring potential and role better, but I'm more confident on Sharp's job security. Only 13 touches on the weekend, but a great kick to handball ratio, use the ball well, also kicked a goal to boost his score. Not as good as the week before, but sold enough for him to make some nice cash for us on our bench. A fine trading option, and even though he's a mature body and been in the system for a while, he comes at a bargain price. Select him with confidence if you decide to go there. I wouldn't say a must-have, though. Riley Sanders was subbed the week before for a below par score and the Bevo factor had us worried. But this time, we got to see a full game from Sanders, which was awesome. Only 57% tog in the first quarter for his 24 points. Was a little bit worried there. Three clearances was good to see. Good pressure, laid a couple of tackles inside 50. Has a lovely sidestep and a nice spread of contested, uncontested possessions as well. Almost kicked his first goal in late stages of the second to hit the post. Another solid second quarter and had already matched Dacos for points at this stage. And he just continued on and actually went past triple figures at one point, but a clanger dropped him to a very respectable 99. This is exactly what we were paying up for. There's nothing better than a sub 200K player having the ability to put out 90 plus scores. And my man, Matty Malta from the Inside the Kennel podcast said he was a one in a million type player a few months ago. So great to see him having an impact. Matty Roberts, what a talent he is. The last of the three Uber rookies, so McKercher, Sanders, and Roberts. A more mature body than the other two, playing a nice role. Has taken the second most kickouts for the Bloods with seven. And they're putting a lot of trust into him. Solid job security and the potential to give you on-field 90s. That means that even though he's had that price rise, I think you can still go there and make it a worthwhile trade-in. I'd be looking to field him each week as an owner. 76, 69, 94 shows us that it's just not as easy as locking a 90 like he did last week, but no disasters there. Got a decent floor, particularly with those bonus kick-ins. Sam Berry, a oh, different story here. A very, very frustrating own. There's so many times where he either gets first hands to it or wins a possession but gets tackled immediately doesn't dispose of it i've seen it so many times in just two weeks i've got a page here of notes on him but it's just depressing reading so i won't go into it but basically he's already been subbed out last week after having minimal impact on the game he's very similar to crouch and laird he isn't tackling enough and Adelaide do need to switch up their midfield mix and switch up quickly. So major warning signs in saying that, even if he is a sub, he's got such a low break even that you could hold for another week. Bench him and say use DPP to trade him to Darcy. That's my plan anyway. I'm spewing I got sucked into this pick. Uh, but it is what it is. And Jai Clark, I was originally thinking of boosting out Clark, but... With the news of Bruin and Atkins out, I decided to hold for another week. He looked okay early, few fumbles, and looked a little out of his league. Should have taken an easy mark, but dropped it, so that went down as a clanger. Got easily stiff-armed by Crouch, also got done for a dangerous tackle on Crouch, which was unlucky. But look, all in all, a better performance. The positive here was that he was on his score of 13 last week. At, in the 18-minute mark of the first. So, finished with 13 touches again. Identical for disposals. Most were contested. But this time, due to better efficiency, he scored a much more respectable 60. So, with Geelong's current outs, there's opportunity. And I hope he takes it with both hands. Parfit's probably the... Well, was the better player last week. I really don't rate Parfit personally. And he's his direct competition for a spot in the side. So, with Clark, I think... I will definitely hold, but for you, just do what you think's best for him. On to the rucks, and at the top we have Tristan Sherry. It hurts seeing this bloke average 108 when you own Grundy. He's the only realistic downgrade option for me, and I can see why some may be looking to go there. When someone at 100k less is performing just as well or arguably better than your ruckman, then the move sort of makes sense. The main issue is that he won't be a keeper, and you'll need to upgrade him again. So do you want to get involved in the ruck merry-go-round or just go up to the best of the best? For me, it's a second option, which is why I won't be going there. In saying that, if you've got no other problems or concerns with your side, you may have saved some trades, 
then Grundy to, to Sherry is fine. Uh, Big Maxi didn't hit the heights of round one, but certainly not the lows of the opening rounds. Popular pick that has made some cash. Definite keeper in my opinion. Good stuff, Maxi. We'll leave it at that. Uh, look, after saying he wasn't really relevant last week, Darcy Cameron, he came out with a 43-point first quarter, six touches, four contested at 100% along with nine hitouts, and only 64% tog at this point in time. Ended with 114 points, but I'll stick to my guns and say look elsewhere. And here's man, Brody Grundy. Look, overall, a disappointing performance, particularly in the first half. I don't think we'll get the Grundy of old back, which is unfortunate. Looked like he was laboring, lacked energy at times. But I did see a couple of good signs as the game went on. In last, he pushed forward, had an elite gather below his knees, fired the handball off for Haywood. Lovely goal assist, but there weren't a lot of highlights. I think the play is to look to flip to English or Marshall at his bye. That's if he can free up the cash to do so. It won't be cheap. He scored this week. We'll have a big say in which way his price will go. It's becoming pretty obvious at this stage that he's not a keeper. So we'll need to move him on ideally sooner rather than later. One of those folks could be Rowan. Looked awesome early on in the game. He's an elite ruckman. And along with English and Gorn in the top three rucks we can select this year. Doesn't have an early buy like Gorn and Grundy who are popular picks. And his scoring is very consistent. 24 disposals, 16 of those contested last week. Which is elite for a big man. And fantastic around the ground. Did get beaten in the hitouts, But I'm not too concerned with that. He also had 11 clearances. So all in all, should be a great selection that will compete for top ruck average. A uh, big kids are on the bye this week, but hit back hard against the Eagles. We expect that though, and would be disappointed if he didn't dominate. We'll chat about him after the conclusion of this round. And Timmy English. English would have been licking his lips with wits out and moil in and dominated again as expected. No surprises here. Good for non-owners that he didn't go a 200. I suppose that's a positive. But a downside for non-owners, it doesn't look like he's going to be coming down anytime soon. And he's now coming up against West Coast. Finished on 138 points. And uh, just owning Grundy and watching this bloke run around, it, it's not going to be fun. I noticed he was on his haunches at the halftime siren, but nothing in it. Just continued on his merry way in the second half. I don't know if I'll be able to watch this Bulldogs West Coast game because he could legit go 180 plus. Granted up to English when Sydney comes up to their buy should be popular, but with his easy fixture up until that point, we may even have to pay more than his starting price. So uh, the Bearman, well, we're not looking to get a bargain at this stage. So come on Grundy, pull your weight, son. On to the forwards, 500k plus, and Dogger Jackson. Oh man, this pick has worked to perfection for me. Exceeded my expectations, destroying non-owners. He showed us his ceiling with a 170 plus score and literally did everything that you'd want to see. I dead set have a page and a half full of handwritten notes just about Dogger from this game, and I could discuss him for the next 10 minutes. But long story short, he's winning hitouts, clunking contested marks, hitting the scoreboard, finding plenty of the pill. Just looks super fit. Janet and I discussed him last night, and the list management decision, decision sorry, to, sh to sign Shrek, that's a tongue twist, a bit of Dr. Seuss stuff there, if you don't mind, to sign him long term, it's a bit of a head scratcher to us. The other thing I need to mention with Jacko's game as well, very close to 100% efficiency, was uh, up until maybe halfway through the fourth quarter, so that was elite as well. Question is, is it too late to trade in Dogger? Well, Freo have stated that Shrek's still two to three weeks away, which gives you some time for him to cover the Gorn and Grundy buys if you've got DPP. He's projected to make 50k in a week. So even when Shrek comes back, surely they ease him in. Dog will spend some solid time in, in the middle. So my answer is no. It's not too late, but this could be a short-term option if Shrek comes back fit and firing. Even then, there's a chance he could average enough even from there to be top eight at least. So love the dogger selection. I think you can get him in. Isaac Heaney, the role continues, his red hot form continues, and his brown low odds continue to plummet. I advised him as the number one trading target last week, and if he decided to jump on the blonde bombshell, you were rewarded. Such a fun player to own, very entertaining to watch. And I'll tell you what, a 30-year-old, whatever he is, 30-odd, 
Taylor Adams, won't be pushing him out of the midfield. Along with Dogger, Janeth and I discussed whether or not it was too late to bring him in. Check it out last night if you really want to. It's a tough call, but we both agreed it is still viable. But do it now or forever hold your peace. Uh, Sammy Flanders started on the bench for the first five minutes. Wasn't huge early, but got into the game with a nice snap for goal after gathering the ball at the back for contest. Was doing a little things well. Intercepted a couple of handballs, which led to scoring shots at the end of the chain. Some nice smothers. Those one percenters go a long way to raising a player's ceiling. Had a really consistent game finishing right on his projected score of 102 from 26 touches and a goal. Been a great starting pick, but arguably the third being behind Heaney and Dogger. A certain hold as an owner leading into his buy and a certain upgrade target for non-owners after his buy. But we'll discuss him in more detail again next week. And Bolton, well, we gave you pre-warning in the pre-season. This bloke is an absolute roller coaster of a pick. We've already seen the good, the bad, the ugly. With so many other relevant options below or above his price point, he doesn't hold any sort of relevance at the moment. On to the forwards, 250 to 500k, and at the top of the list, we have Tommy Pound. Now, I wanted to give some big thanks to Big J here. I was on the phone with him, I think it was Thursday night. He was all over this pick, and that's why we've got the new Big J symbol there alongside the Best Buy. It seems like there is a lot of upside to this pick. We know he was an early selection, or early enough, and the talent's always been there. He's passed Will Phillips by a mile, and his role's absolutely fantastic. Now, I know that this isn't sustainable, but the bloke attended 93% CBAs after mid-70s last week. That's pretty hard to deny. Last week, he accumulated 28 touches, 9 contested at 85% efficiency, <clears throat> throwing 8 clearances, 5 tackles, 2 goals. That is an elite game. The issue is... Are those numbers sustainable? Well, he won't average two goals, but the tackle count can stay along with the possession count as long as he keeps that role. There are other players that could potentially step up and he may be only a few poor games away from losing that main CBA role. Big J was going through the North team sheets and it doesn't look like he'll be displaced. Remember the week before he also scored 90 plus, which got him on our watch list in the first place. So at the price with the role, and a break-even of negative 47. He looks to be a fantastic buy to me, and he may even make the same amount of money as a rookie, as well as giving us some good on-field points. And who knows, if things continue, he could be our F6 for the rest of the season. We'll also get mid-DPP, which will be mighty handy for future trade plans as well. Possibly the perfect M9 F7 swing for the year. As things currently stand, he is coming into my side. I think he's one of the biggest must-haves this week. And 2-2, two, two, I am all aboard the power train. Uh, Jackie Billens was a popular option last week to bring in after his 119, but didn't hit those heights. Obviously, the marks weren't sustainable. Kicked an early goal, which was nice. 21 points at quarter time. I kept on comparing him to Fisher, because obviously that was my trade for the week. Uh, and it wasn't good. But, look, he missed an opportunity for an open goal on the right peg, which hurt and was in and out of the game a little bit. That can happen with the role. The other downside was that this bloke was playing so wide. Not what you want to see, but I rate him. We know he's got a decent history in that role. Due to the sub game leaving his price cycle, that break even has become a lot friendlier. Don't trade him in, but don't trade him out. Uh, Max King got the Muppet symbol there because he's been rubbed out. Not sure if they've appealed. Haven't heard anything so far. But had a red-hot start. I love the alteration to his role, just allowing him to come up the ground a little bit more, get involved in scoring chains rather than just being at the end of them. But let's be honest, we're not going there. And we've got Powell. Go there every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Uh, on to another twin in Harry Mackay. I know for a fact people are looking at what I refer to as the Hogan move from now on. Or for some, they may be planning on trading him in as a season-long keeper. Who knows? But he's in great form, has had his kicking boots on, his body will be rested, he's coming up against North. If you if you add another ceiling score to his 200-plus scores that he's already banked, then he could not only provide a nice ceiling score during the best 18 round against North Melbourne, but he could make you some rapid cash, win a winner. However, if he doesn't score well for some reason, then you may be stuck with a non-keeper that doesn't make enough cash for it to be worth all the hassle. If he plays a bit of ruck relief, that's a bonus. Uh, so yeah, an aggressive move that I suppose could pay off. 
Uh, Fifey, a lovely triple figure score in round one, followed by a respectable score in relation to time on ground last week. Was subbed out, but Damo from the footy mailbag had told me he'd spoken to Longmuir, and this was always on the cards due to that short turnaround between games. Looked good when he was out there, led that resurgence in a way. Now, apparently there have been whispers of some back tightness, but I'm hoping things are all good. If they are, I expect him to play at least, say, four full games in a row. If you can do that, I think we can officially call him a successful pick, assuming he continues with that current scoring rate. Uh, Jordan, one thing I can say about JJ is that he's scoring extremely consistently. Three games and three scores in the 80s. And the pattern's going up, 81, 84, and then he goes up again to an 88 next, uh, sorry, this week. His stat line is consistent. 18 touches, 19 touches, 18 touches. Also averaging five tackles a game to boost his floor. We love players that can give us stable scores. Uh, not like the Bolton type. So in his last game, he started off pretty slow, but got into it. And as time went on, he had more of an impact. Kicked a ripping goal from the boundary. Skidded through from, I reckon it was about 50 with about a minute and a half to go. So some nice icing on the cake there for his score. The ship has certainly sailed on this one. So for many, a play may be to flip him at the buy, but we'll, let's just say, reassess him in two weeks. Oh, Jesse Hogan, don't want to talk about this. Go back and listen to my rant last night if you want. Oh, quickly, it was a game where nothing went right. Kicking was off. He was on 10 goals, two for the season, but that abandoned him. I've got so many notes. Okay, random one. Um, so close to two contested pack marks in the third. You can see his frustration. Uh, and I tell you what, believe me, I was as frustrated as him. It was killing me. Balls were falling out of his fingertips. He was getting burnt for options such as Daniel and Harvey. Thomas, I could go on, but I won't. Long story short, it's fine to trade, or you can use him as a possible loop, hold another week, make some more coin, and then move him on, depending on how he goes. He's gone for me. It was a quick and painful relationship that uh, Jesse and I shared. Zachy Fisher, talk about another terrible relationship. I'm not sure if this is just bait, but of course he looks like a different man this week. As soon as I traded him, this was locked in app and actually found the ball and used it well, played with a bit of footy IQ, and at times, again, the ball was just falling into his lap like the Prakey match. Took a couple of chess mark intercepts just from opposition turnovers by foot. A couple of dunk, dump kicks from memory. I do remember one unlicky, un, unlicky. Oh my goodness. It is, this is not good. Let's get through it, people. Unlucky. Deliberate free kick against. So a few points lost there. Also had his set shot for goal touched on the line. And it wasn't even from that far out. I was surprised he didn't get the distance, but all in all, he doubled his score from last week, finished on a 101 from 25 touches and two marks. As a small bonus, taking five kickouts in total. I think he's fine to hold for now, but I would not be trading him in. Uh, Rankin, bit of a nothing pick. He's looked really good in some patches and gone missing. He'll put up a good ceiling score here and there, but his floor worries me, and I'd recommend to jump off if you don't have any more pressing issues and bringing someone that will just provide some value. And Toby Green, extremely disappointing for those that were looking to take advantage of that early fixture and flip. It just hasn't worked out. The scoring hasn't been there. So for me, it's time to say goodbye, move on from Tobes. Has a buy this week, then we'll most likely lose cash the week after. So I'll bought now, in my opinion. And we'll finish off with the forwards under 250k. Thanks for sticking with me. Been a massive week so far. Dempsey, well, Things didn't really pan out for Dempsey last week. Lost opportunities. Could have kicked a check side goal, but out in the full. Things that could have been. Could have got a free kick for a push in the back just outside the goal square, but didn't. Just little things like that. But in saying that, scored 96 a week before. Hit the scoreboard multiple times. Has fantastic VFL numbers. Average 102 from, I think it was 12 to 15 games from memory. Tends to push up the ground a lot. Get involved in the play, which helps his scoring. And has a decent matchup this week against the Hawkers. A mighty fine trading option. And I was speaking to Jared Waitley about him at Fox Studios before the season opener. And he said the Cats absolutely love him. He's dead set locked into their 22 and will play every week if fit. I wouldn't go as far as saying he's an absolute must-have like a McKercher, but I would highly recommend trying to fit him into your plans. If you can't, there's always a Darcy as an alternative next week. And talking about Mr. Darcy, he's going to be such an elite player of the comp. Now, Asterix there, the rule breaker, he's only played the one game, but we've got to discuss this bloke. We, we have to discuss him. What a bright future. He's so much better than Rory Lobb, it's not funny. 
He did everything, bit of rough relief work, intercept marks down back, contested marks up forward, hit the scoreboard. His reach is insane. Perfect timing from Bevo to play him as well because he'll be a great downgrade option for us when he's on the bubble. It's always dangerous to go early, but with 100 plus Uber coach points to his name after his first game, he will tempt a few. I'll be waiting, but he's pretty much locked into my trade plans in the coming week. He does play West Coast though. And who knows what he could score, particularly in that ruck relief role. He's got great follow-up from those ruck contests. Jeez, I'm thinking about going to him myself. But I remember it, the, the ball went to ground. I think it was in the second. And then just below his knees, so athletic, laid the tackle on Rao. Just little things like that really impressed me. But we will talk about him a little bit more next week. Uh, Harvey Thomas, jeez, this is out of the box. 21 touches, 8 tackle, eight tackles, and a goal. That was phenomenal, wasn't it, from the young fella? After posting some underwhelming scores to start the season, but all of a sudden, he'll make some good coin. But the ship has definitely sailed here. We'll talk about him next week if we need to. Catters looked like a different beast, didn't he? Particularly compared to last year. Completely different player. Finding his feet now, bigger, stronger. The confidence is there. GWS, they're playing fantastic footy. How's that massive grab in the final siren? Just left his... Best to last this man and bang through his third goal. Brilliant performance by the former number one pick. Really exceeded my expectations. The only downer for me is that I didn't have him on field, which was definitely a, a mistake in hindsight. Uh, Darcy Wilson, just do what he needs to do as a rookie. We aren't seeing the same numbers as that preseason game, which is expected. There's been a bit of a pattern of starting slow and then finishing off the game well with Wilson. I think that's due to his elite endurance, which is a plus. Ideally, just leave him on the pine and let him make you some money. Uh, Buku Kamas played a good game. He was playing in defense, pushed up a little bit. Also had a set shot, uh, sorry, not a set shot, but a shot on the run from about 40 out. Didn't convert though. Then received a 50 meter penalty and converted that set shot. Took some fantastic one-on-one -on -one marks. Looks to have a really big future. They're blessed with big men at the dogs. And this guy is really exciting. A pod rookie pick as well and matching some of the more popular picks. So yeah, well done if you selected Buku. Uh, Harley Reid, we've got plenty of players to talk about, so no need to talk about Harley Reid. We all own him, we're not trading him. He'll just continue to either take a spot on field or provide backup on our benches. The main issue is just that, field or bench, maybe a week-to-week -week proposition based on form and matchups. Uh, Mana managed to get a full game. Uh, managed, I just thought about that. I won't go with it though. I already have too late. After starting his sub the week before, did have an impact when he came onto the ground. Last week, got an early goal from a close assist, then gave Wayne assist to Myers the next scoring play. It looked awesome, and I was thinking must trade in this week at this stage, but then really start to slow up. My interest did wane slightly. Look, cheap price, DPP, may sway you towards taking the punt because he's a mature age player who the Cats drafted to have an immediate impact. I'd prefer Dempsey, but if you, yeah, if you can't break the bank, he, he could be the one for you. A Gallagher, again, better options. Real pod pick. If you know something I don't know about his prospects, you could go for him. Uh, Burgess played a solid game. Actually had an opportunity to kick three goals in a game for the first time in his career, but fluffed his lines, hit the post from about 30 out. A pod option, again, pretty low ownership. Far from a sexy pick, but you could go worse. Better options at this stage, though. Uh, Dersma, such a talented player, elite at what he does. Again, I won't spend a heap of time on him, though. Great hands, composed, seems to have a nice set shot routine. It's the role that's not great for Supercoach, and I'll be finding the extra 100-odd K to go up to power. Uh, Sethi Campbell, good performance in the opening round, quiet out the week after, and then bounced back last week for another decent game. But for me, the ship has sailed here. You go your Dempsey or Darcy as an owner, it's still an easy hold. And a very late edit here. I did forget about three really important players. Now, two of them do have the buy this week, but people may be looking to trade them out. So very, very quickly, apologies, I don't have the visual there. I'm running out of time, so I need to squeeze this in. First one's Tommy Berry. Very popular trading option last week. We thought we were purchasing a berry, but some say they purchased a potato. At the start of the game, he was running up to the stoppage, leaving Richards behind. That changed not long after. Had just a single handball to his name at quarter time for only 57% tog. Then got caught high by Jones early in the second. Then converted a really nice set shot from about 45 out and a 45 degree angle. And we thought, here we go. 
He is on now. I was actually surprised to see it sail through. Not really known for his elite kicking skills. It's more his hardness and pressure type stuff. But to be honest, it was the only highlight. Just wasn't his day. He dropped an uncontested chess mark, then kicks it directly to a Bulldogs player. I mentioned how surprised I was that he hit triple figures the score the, sorry, the week before. And unfortunately, it looks as if that may have been a bit of a one-off. Just the 26 points from seven touches and a goal and a bit of a spew if you had him on field. On the upside, he did go up 44k. Uh, I'll quickly go with Lazaro now. Early on, it looked like he was going to make up for his poor round one score and even potentially turn up, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. The poor bloke got subbed. He was actually playing well, but I'm sure Clarko had his reasons. You could actually keep him for another week if you got more pressing issues, but the red flags are starting to mount. No way you bring him in, but as an owner, you've got a real decision on your hands here. And the last man we'll discuss this week is a big one, and he's lost his sex appeal. All of a sudden, there is a lot of discussion as to whether or not Alex Sexton is a trade-out option. Look, great in the Pracky match. If we think back a little bit, then good in his first match, okay in his second, and then not so great against the Dogs. So sort of down, down, down like the Coles had. He was quite in the first with only three kicks in the mark, average second, but then the damage actually came in the second half. Had a shocking turnover kick in the third, got dumped by Vandermeer, then gave him just a, it was a tap on the head to give a silly 50 away. Just a score killer, but Vandermeer should be done for staging, to be honest. Weak as water. When Atkins was subbed on for long, Sexton was moved forward for a while, which was a big concern. Janeth mentioned that it was also possibly due to the shift of Lacocious and potentially just a domino effect type scenario given the fact that Sexton is much more of a capable four than Atkins. Maybe he was just having a dog of a day. Dimmer thought, let's just chain things up for him to see if he can provide some spark. So, uh, look, I'm, I'm certainly in the, in the hold camp. He was talking about the move down back in an article the other day that I was reading and talked about the discussions that took place pre-season. So I'm keeping the faith for now. He's had one single kick. In, in every match as a mini bonus, but not much. If he does lose his defensive role, I'm out of the pick immediately, but there's still a fair bit of meat on the bone. So I'm in the hold camp for now. But that's all the rookies, guys, in the forward line. Stocky over for this week. So hope you have an awesome week yourself. I'm absolutely buggered. Time to uh, hit the sack for me. So much love, guys. Take care. And I'll see you soon in the next one. Cheers, bye.